Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Join News today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Lemne. We're on DTT because we're free to wear on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125. We are a home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, we ask our Ghanaians being misled on plot to remove IGP as controversy dippings over the leaked IGP tape. You know, Chairman of Parliament's ad hoc committee, Samuel Atachia, is suggesting that the initial tape might have been altered. We have more as lawyers for the accusers of the IGP say the latest developments solidifies their case. The, the, the tape is incomplete. It's been truncated. It's been ed edited. If you remember, we're asking them, which ones do you validate? We'll tell you about the petition by some aggrieved police officers on their promotions. Also this afternoon, lawyers of one of the applicants in the injuncted case against the Electoral Commission, Precious Haita, is attempting to serve a contempt application on the EC for the third time. We have details for you. Plus, demolition begins on the Accra Tema motorway toll boats in a bit to check the incidence of accidents at those points. We have the latest coming from the motorway for you. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Join News on TV. My personal handle is at Denana Aisha. Please stay for details. <laughs> The Ghana Highway Authority has commenced demolition work at their car and Tema toll booths in a bid to improve traffic flow and reduce the risk of road accidents. Two out of the eight booths have been earmarked for demolition. The demolition is currently underway at the Tema toll booth. My colleague Carlos Caloni is at the demolition site in our report. I'm currently at the Tama tow boat on the Accra Tama motorway where the Ghana Highways Authority is demolishing two boats out of the eight uh, on the Accra Tama motorway. Originally, there are about uh, eight on this particular stretch, and officials of the Ghana Highways Authority have been telling us that they are doing away with two that sit on the original Accra Tama motorway. So, as you can see in your picture, the uh, contractor is actually demolishing the boat there and this happened also at the Accra end of the motorway. I have with me the contractor that is taking this particular work to share with us uh, uh, how they are going about it and what the motoring uh, public should be expecting, what message they have for them. So you started this particular uh, activity uh, from yesterday. Tell us, uh, you started from the tow boat in Accra. How long did that last and what exact work did you do then? All right, uh, I'm Samuel Aidan. I'm one of the site engineers of China Railway Number no. Five Engineering. We have been contracted to do the demolition exercise on the tow boat, on the Tema and Accra main tow boat. Well, we actually began the Accra one. That was yesterday around 3:30 p.m., which lasted about four hours into the night. Well, uh, here this morning we are on the uh, Tema Two Plaza to and then we are expecting to finish up within the same uh, period of time. But as it stands now, the only challenge we are facing is uh, oncoming vehicles from Tema heading towards Accra. But the only thing uh, we are saying is that vehicles from Tema towards Accra should kindly exercise patience as we we'll finish up within a short period of time. I see you have mounted some warning signs there just to direct the flow of traffic. So uh, how many of the boats are you demolishing today? Well, we are demolishing two. That is the main one. That is the main stretch. The main one on the Tema and Accra uh, uh, stretch. Yeah, the main one. What will be uh, next after the demolition? Do you know? Okay, well, when we are done with the demolition exercises, we convey the debris and then uh, the Ministry of Roads and Highways take charge from there. Okay, so um, when are we to see the concrete work to clear the road for motorists to actually use? Well, uh, for us, that is, we've been the contractor. We hope to finish this work within maybe the next four hours. The rest is left for Ministry of Roads and Highways to decide. Thank you so much for talking to us. So uh, that was the uh, contractor actually undertaking the demolition work here 
at the Tama Toll Plaza on the Accra Tama Motorway. Join news to keep you posted on any development from this particular site. Reporting from the Tama Toll Boat, my name is Carlos Caloni for Join News. No other site engineer for the ongoing partial demolition works on the Akratim motorway says the next phase of work on the stretch will involve the installation of barricades to enhance the free flow of traffic before civil work begins shortly after the demolition. Well, in the next two hours, uh, the demolition exercise you see behind me will be done. So when we are done, we are going to install temporary what, uh, barricades, that is desert barriers or concrete barriers, to define and to deter cars onto the extreme right. This one is to enable us to be able to do the civil works at where I am standing now. That is on the main Temamoto way. When we are done with the temporal uh, installation of the concrete barriers and then with the civil works, we are now going to install permanent barriers which will then what direct traffic onto the motorway where I'm standing now. How long is that? process going to take well uh with the installation of the barriers we should say it's going to last just for an hour provided everything is okay everything moves smoothly it's going to last just for an hour that is the temporal one but other civil works is what that we uh, estimate that probably in the next day or two we should be done with everything okay and then uh, where, when are you going to start with the installation of the permanent barricade okay that is when uh everything Street lights, everything has been fully what installed. Then we can move into install the permanent barricades. So all in all, uh, what time frame are we looking at? So we have a permanent flow of traffic onto the Accra Tama motorway. Well, uh, with respect to our uh, that is China Railway, we hope to finish our works uh, probably by tomorrow. So, in fact, we are working day and night. We are communicating with the other contractors too, who are also actively engaging in uh, whatever works we are doing. So we hope uh, to finish by the next two days. Everything should be done by the next two days. Let's now turn our attention to the western region where residents of Agunankwanta Discove and Agunankwanta Bansu want their bad roads fixed immediately. Led by the Hunter West Ghana Private Road Transport Union, the angry residents blocked roads linking the two communities to press home their demand. It took the intervention of the MCE to clear the roadblock, which lasted eight hours on Monday morning, September 11, to make way for traffic, the demonstrators presented a petition to the MCE impressing on government to act immediately. The residents blocked the Agunankwanta Discove and Agunankwanta Bansu Road due to the poor state of the road, demanding that the president listen to their pleas. The blockade, which lasted for eight hours, was eventually cleared when the MCE met leaders of the demonstration and the GPRTU. First was the GPRTU, which presented its petition to the MC, asking government to act immediately. Thomas Tichy is a Takrati district chairman of the union. The miserable condition of roads in the Hunter West Municipal, where our able drivers fly their professional daily. This petition is to draw your attention to the bad state of the main roads leading to the municipal capital and its environments, environments which are acquired there. This cove, Buzia, Cape Three Points, Ewutuma, Ewutumano, Butri, Abuade, Aketechi, New Amanfo, Funko, Banso, Bukro, and Agonan Quanta being municipal capital and among others. Our Honorable Municipal Chief Executive, please, 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 the deplorable state of the rules poses life threatening dangers to our drivers. The MCE, John Ajari, assured that some repair works will be undertaken until central government intervenes. It's taxpayers' money, and therefore you have to gather the money before you can do any other thing. God's so good, we have gotten something that we can use to at least shape in the road for some time. And we'll do some small patching, reshaping, which of course, in Penifuno, we have started something. 
and because of demonstration, in tea, they are suspended. When you finish, see, see, now, why you know, why general tomb there, we general, you may have tomorrow going, we will greater works in Rokoduma. What do you be a We can't repair it entirely, but there are any there, yeah, you had able to now, baby, can't 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 able to me, yeah, yeah, go from a time, petition was abbey, you're able to me, you do so, no, what's in any yaw, what's in usu, now, what banner full construction work and Kasanka side and aqua quano. Let's stick on roads because some residents in the Sesala East Municipality and the East District in the Upper West Region are also unhappy about the poor state of roads in the two Sesala areas. The areas which are considered as a food basket of the region have terrible roads. And Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam travelled on the Halamboy Nabulu Du East and Road uh, Transports and, and reports that vehicles flying that route often break down, leaving passengers stranded. If there is only one thing that the Cesar East Municipality and the West District have in common, apart from sharing boundaries, is the deplorable roads that have enveloped the two Cesar enclaves. The cruel reality, however, is that the enclave is the food basket of the region and sometimes tops the chart in the country when it comes to maize production. The irony of the aforementioned is that when the European Union granted the government over 35 million euros to construct farm access roads, they were completely ignored, prompting protests from the chiefs and people of the Cesar Enclave, who yielded no results. This is the fancy Halomboy Nebrodu East Road, which is about 53 kilometers. It is deplorable, bumpy, full of big gullies and small dams. One will have mistaken for one of the government flagship programs, One Village, One Dam. We bump into these women, majority of whom were traveling from Mandwani and Nablu in the Sesala East to Fancy in the West District Finra. There were over two dozen of them being transported by two motorcanes and both were stuck on one of the many big gullies filled with water. The operators and some of the few passengers are some forces to push them out. Back here in Accra, controversy is deepening. Uh, well, we'll bring you more on the uh, tape that has led to the committee probing the uh, alleged ousting of the IGP. Now, chairman of that committee, Samuel Atachian, suggests the initial tape might have been altered. This revelation comes after the chief witness in the alleged plot to remove the IGP, Daniel Bugrinabu, submitted a new tape. COP elects Mensa and Superintendent George Osari, who have accused the IGP, had previously testified that portions of the tape were tampered with for malicious purposes and requested the full conversation with Chief Bugri Nabu. Let's recap their request when they first appeared before the committee. I think, as I said, I hear a voice that represents my voice. But I can't accept everything in the conversation. Yes, Mr. Chair, but there is some cut and paste on the audio, but that notwithstanding, the voice in it is mine. So has a tape been really doctored here? is a response of the committee, of the, uh, the chairman of the committee, Asamal Atache. If you care to know, there was the first audio that went viral, which was the basis of what uh, to make the referral to the committee. So you might want to call it the first thing. And then when we played out the first thing to uh, uh, witness, they said that the, the tape is incomplete. It's been truncated. It's been 
editor, if you remember, we're asking her, which ones do you validate and which one do you reject? And he said, their voices are valid here, but the rest of them, they disagree. And then we've, we've got a second tip, which is supposed to be the full complement of the conversation that Chief Bugri Nabu, Dr. Nassari, a COP Mensa had at Chief Bugri Nabu's office in Usu. So that's the second tip. As the second tip suggests that indeed the initial tip uh, which went viral uh, is, is a doctored one. It seems to be the case because the second tip is one which is a very long discussion which I can come to some understanding that they do not dispute. Alfred Papa Dakwa, his lawyer for one of the witnesses, Superintendent George Asari, indicates the latest twist to the case confirms their suspicion about the authenticity of the tape. He joins me live for a conversation. Counsel, I'm grateful for your time. What is the justification that this latest information uh, actually justifies your case? Hello, lawyer Dakwa. Hello? All right, so it looks like uh, there's a problem getting uh, lawyer Dakwa on the line. He's lawyer for Superintendent George Asari, and he indicates the latest twist to the case confirms their suspicion about the authenticity of the tape. Lawyer Dakwa, if you can hear me, I'm asking what's your justification that this latest twist uh, actually confirms your suspicion good afternoon um i think we should look at it from the beginning right from the onset it has been our case that the tape that was played to the witnesses was an edited tape we have we had a transcript of the tape and we went through it and our clients were fortified that indeed the meeting itself lasted for over two or three hours. The tape that was circulating was just a 50 minute tape, and there had been some editing and cut and paste that they alluded to. Okay, so, so um, there was some cut and paste. Yes, yes, yes. According yes. to your, your client? Yes, yes. So um, what next for you with this new uh, development? Well, you know, another tape has been given to us. Okay. And um, we have looked at it. So I think in camera we shall also uh, uh, provide our position on that tape. Mind you, when uh, Bugri Nabu appeared before the committee, mm. he indicated that the first tip was the authentic tip. Suddenly, he has come again with another tip. And you, you, you would recall that during that period, Bugri Nabu stated on oath that he didn't even have a duplicate of the tip. Everything was given to the president. Uh, the question you should be asking is, did he go to the president for the, the tape, or this is a, another manufactured one. We do not know. We, when we get there, we will cross it. But as it is now, there is a new tape that he has provided, and we've looked at it. And uh, when we meet at the committee, we shall also state our position on it. Counsel, I'm grateful for your time. Lawyer Alfred uh, Papadakwa is a lawyer for Superintendent George Asari. Let's now bring in my colleague Samuel Mbura because we have secured the petition before the ad hoc committee by 85 senior police officers of the holdup of their promotions by the IGP Akofo Dampari. Mbura, who are the petitioners and what are their requests? Aisha, the petitioner says he is a Ghanaian with interest in the alleged attempts to oust the IGP, Dr. George Akufudan Pari, from office 
arise under the Whistleblowers Act, Act 720-2006, to petition the committee of alleged acts of injustice perpetrated against some officers of the Ghana Police Service. It is his assumption that the police council cannot absorb itself of complicity in this matter because it is not as if the council is not aware of these issues in the police service. According to him, one of the reasons these things keep happening is lack of clearly laid down procedure for the promotion of senior officers and their promotion is at the discretion of the Inspector General of Police, the IGP. An example in the petition is that someone can be promoted to the rank of a, a deputy commissioner of police because, of, uh, he, uh, because the person has acquired a master's degree. Another person who acquires the same level of education is not promoted, although they both belong to the same intake. He made specific mention to some senior officers who have been promoted ahead of, ahead of their colleagues and those who have overstayed their ranks. The petitioner therefore wants the committee consider all these concerns and look into, the, uh, into them. We, we know that the chairman of the committee yesterday responded to this. What did he say in Bura? Someone like Tasha said that at the moment they are dealing with the substantive issues. When they are done with that, they can look into other issues as well. But he has confirmed receipt of the petition. Mm. Meanwhile, the IGP Akofo Dampari has dismissed the claims of holding up promotions in the service. Listen. I would say that is the position because they are the people to promote. And more importantly, recently a meeting was held and some consideration has been done. But the most important thing is that everybody who's supposed to be promoted in line with our policies are being promoted. But the point that has to be made is that it's not a question about how many years you have been at the place. We would have all loved to be promoted as soon as we are four years and thereabout. Vacancy, competences, and other things factor into it. I myself, at a point, I was in my, on my rank for six years, and I didn't complain because I understand. Away from the IGP, lawyers of one of the applicants in the injuncted case against the Electoral Commission, Precious Saita, are trying for the third time to serve a contempt application to the EC. According to the lawyers, two previous attempts have failed because no EC commissioner has agreed to meet them to receive the application. My colleague James Averji has been at the Electoral Commission headquarters and a small. We've been here for almost 30 minutes now. Uh, together, we came to meet the uh, lawyer for the, plain, uh, the applicant as well as the bailiff. And in our interaction with them, they made us know that they've been here on uh, Tuesday as well as yesterday, Wednesday, in an attempt to serve that contempt application on them. Uh, but nothing came out of that. And so the third attempt is today. And uh, uh, the lawyer for uh, the, plan, uh, the applicant is here with me. And so uh, for the 30 minutes, he himself, as well as the bailiff, have been having some interactions with the uh, police personnel at post here. And uh, uh, some uh, persons who were going in and out of the EC premises, uh, the lawyer uh, joins me to pass more on what they've been picking from the security as well as those who've been going in and out of the EC premises and a bit more on that. And so thank you, Council, for joining us. Uh, I've seen you interact with the police and uh, other persons. Uh, what have they been telling you? Um, so far, the message has been simple. That we have to, they can, nobody's allowed to come in or out of, they don't, they're not admitting anybody into the EC's premises. That is the message we've been getting. And they've, they've told us that if we want to serve anybody, we have to call the person personally for the person to either come out.
to come and receive the process. So that is the information that we've been given. We've tried as much as possible to uh, pull strings together so that because the people that we are serving, we are serving um, the EC chairperson herself, Dr. Um, Bosman, and then one Mr. Samotete. Those are the people, that, and it is hard to reach them. So if the if they if we're given access at least, the bailiff could have gone inside to attempt service. What was the reason for not allowing you into into the premises? They didn't offer any reason per se. I think. Uh, the reason is instructions from above. Nobody is allowed to enter or move out of the premises. So we've been denied access once again. What that means is that you would have to wait a bit longer to see if you can get access or if you see any of the EC officials, you would attempt to serve them the application. Like I said, we are trying to pull our strings and see if we can be able to effect service today. So we'll try our best. To effect service today. What does all of this mean to your application? Oh, um, it's a contempt application and the, the law on contempt application is that it has to be served personally on the respondent who is affected by the contempt application. Head of local government service Dr. Atoata has unveiled plans to initiate a comprehensive capacity building program aimed at establishing effective client service units within the local government system. Dr. Atoata highlighted a range of persistent challenges including the presence of untrained human resources, inadequate staff designations, office logistics and a lack of clearly defined professional procedures and reporting relationships. There's more in the following report. To address these challenges, the Office of the Head of Local Government Service, with the support of the Ghana Security Cities Support Program, has delivered systems and structures and standardized procedures and is set to carry out capacity building activities towards establishing functional client service units in the local government service. This is going to be a two-pronged approach. A client service operational manual for, of procedures, tools and structures, and a scheme of service for the establishment of the client service class. It is important to establish it in the sense that today some people are client service, tomorrow because it's not a class, before I realize, he said, we are converting to HR, we are converting to procurement. But if this class is there, it goes to the apex like chief engineer, chief general planning officer, chief uh, budget analyst. That we think will actually solve this problem of conversion, upgrade, and others. Local governance is evolving. Citizens have become more discerning and demand accountability from duty bearers. This calls for professional motivated client service to readily receive requests and grievances despite them. The United States of America has made a further commitment towards supporting Africa's effort in transitioning to cleaner energy with the establishment of a $1.75 million training center in Ghana. This was revealed by the U.S. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the State for International Security and Non-Proliferation and Gaza. Samuel Kujabriz of our energy desk was at the regional conference on civil nuclear energy development in our report. Ghana's effort towards energy transition has received a major boost from the United States of America with the establishment of a $1.75 million training center in the country. This training simulator will support workforce development across the African region, making Ghana a leader in the continent's energy transition effort. Anne Geza is a U.S. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Non-Proliferation. First is a capacity building program, and I am very proud to announce today that the United States is establishing here in Ghana a regional hub for the first program for the workforce development, university partnerships, and training of the next generation of nuclear engineers, technicians, scientists to help prepare for that nuclear transition. It will, uh, we are also providing a simulator for a small modular reactor control room. 
She says the United States is committed to supporting the use of innovative clean energy technologies to power global decarbonization efforts. We like to talk about ensuring that civil nuclear cooperation is under the highest standards of safety, security, and safeguards. We all want nuclear power to help us address climate change. It is a clean energy source and it needs to be part of the energy mix. And Geza explains that the choice of Ghana is influenced by the country's eagerness to build its first nuclear reactor. Now, Ghana is in a pretty good position. You have a nuclear regulatory authority. Um, I was very pleased your Department of Energy told me that you had a good, consistent training program for nuclear engineers and the like. So you, you, are, you are in a good position for this, but we are working with you to make sure that when that nuclear reactor is built, that it will be under those highest standards of safety, security, and safeguards. Enobot Agboro, the Executive Secretary of the African Commission on Nuclear Energy, AFCON, believes African countries must consider nuclear energy as a critical source for their survival. In order to be sure that our children and our grandchildren will have power, we develop a type of energy source that has a long lifetime. That is nuclear power. Typical nuclear reactor has a lifetime with today's technology of 50 to 80 years. Gas power, solar, we're talking 15 to 20 years, which means you have to build new ones. Is the climate going to be conducive to build new ones? Is there going to be money? What's the situation going to be like? But if you have a source of power like nuclear with a very high energy density, for example, one kilogram of uranium gives you the same amount of power like 90 tons of coal. You don't need to keep digging and mining and adding carbon in the air. This project is supported by the Foundational Infrastructure for Responsible Use of Small Modular Reactor Technology First Capacity Building Program, in which Ghana has participated since 2022. For Joy News, I am Samuel Kojobres, Accra. And that takes us to a break. When we return, we'll bring you a business shortly. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News today with me, Pius Kojo Baka, a senior finance lecturer and also the head of banking and finance at the University of Professional Studies. Dr. Gladys Nabil has cautioned that the financial positions of ADB cannot support the bank to take over the National Investment Bank. According to her, it will be a setback to merge two struggling banks in the current economic conditions where banks are struggling or trying to recover from the domestic debt exchange program. Now, government is said to have completed all moves for the takeover, but Dr. Nabil advised government to rather seek alternative funding for both banks to resuscitate the operations. Now, if you look at this merger or takeover, if ADB is made losses, and given the economic situation, we are not aware whether ADB can turn around its losses to profit by next year or by the end of this year. How then is it able to now take over a company that has accrued so much losses over the years? Since 2021, NIB has been you know, struggling till date. How is it going to consolidate its losses? and liabilities to be able to turn around within the shortest possible time. You have to know that during takeover situations, there are a lot of issues that have to be factored in. The consolidation process, which needs to take time, at least it will take ADB not less than six months to be able to stabilize, to bounce back to the economy. So I don't think that this is the right move. Now, some rural banks have expressed concerns over the slow recovery of loans due to the current economic challenges and the domestic debt exchange program. This, they say, is affecting the operations and may lead to a spike in non-performing loans this year. According to board chairman of Fias Berman Rural Bank, Dr. Anthony Sapon, this will largely affect the performance of these banks in achieving profitability this year. These rural banks say they've been grappling with high cost of operations in recent times. Dr. Sapon is worried about the high lending rates. 
Well, there are a lot of concerns, um, knowing very well that with all the happenings, it's almost always difficult to chase um, for um, people to pay loans and the like, and we had to put in more. That means that you would have to spend a bit more in following up on people, try to run out on people so as to reduce whatever issues there is, so as to reduce your loss levels. And so, yes, that has been the major challenge for us. Um, aside that, you, we all know what uh, has happened in, in these times where we have the DDEP. He's, however, optimistic of a positive outlook in the last quarter of this year due to some measures being put in place by some of these rural banks. In terms of the advances, it is not easy, but a lot of effort has gone in there because we have set up, we've had issues where we had more loans, a lot of loans outstanding looked like going bad. And so we had to also set up a recovery team where efforts, a lot of efforts has been put in and we are seeing better results from that. In all of this, rural banks have been entreated to improve their credit management so as to avoid fall in their profitability. For Joy Business, James Ishen. And I'm Pius Kujubaka with the business segment on Joy News Today. That's it for business. Let's do sports now on Joy News Today with me, Mufta Nabila Abla, Black Stars head coach Chris Hilton has expressed his excitement about the performance of home-based players who were given an opportunity in Ghana's international friendly against Liberia on a Tuesday. Media members Jonathan Sowa and Fatal Hamid made their senior national team debut in that 3-1 victory over the Leon Stars and his size. This gives them opportunity to motivate other players within the local scene who aspire to play for the national team. Very, very conscious of what um, uh, any introduction into the camp uh, from local players. I'm very, very conscious of that. And that that's why I... Um, stay here for periods to watch watch as many games as I can here. Um, but it's it's always going to be about competition, and um, when it comes to whatever squad, I have to pick the whatever it is 24, 25 uh, man squad that I think is the best squad to uh, get the result that um, that we need to get. Sometimes uh, injuries can give others an opportunity, and. Uh, uh, the, we, of course, had an opportunity for two, both players from Midian, that, and I think both done well, particularly um, Jonathan coming on in that last minute and um, giving the team um, a real lift, I think, in that period, particularly when the game opens up. But really pleased for Hamid as well and, uh, to, to make his debut. So I think that's probably... For them too, I think that's great encouragement. It's great encouragement for more, more of our local players to want to aspire to. Yes. Let's talk athletics now. And long distance athletes across the country can now heave a sigh of relief as a prestigious Accra Marathon event returns this year. The event will now be known as the first National Bank Accra Marathon. There's more in the following report. Wednesday morning saw the new dawn of one of Ghana's most beloved sporting events as the Accra Marathon unveiled First National Bank as its headline sponsor. The five-year partnership follows an agreement with the Dansuman Fit Club, organizers of the marathon, and paves the way for the reactivation of one of the most iconic sporting events on the Ghanaian sports calendar after a six-year hiatus. Today we gather to unveil this partnership and it not only strengthens First National Bank's commitment to Ghana, it also exemplifies our dedication to promoting sports, promoting fitness, and nurturing uh, communal spirits and nurturing communities, especially the communities that we are exposed to as a bank and those that we work with regularly. So we are here really to, uh, very proud to announce that we are becoming the headline sponsors of the First National Bank Accra Marathon. Thank you. As has been covered by, by Benjamin quite extensively, but also, as you may know, the Accra Marathon is an event that has in the past drawn many thousands of runners and spectators from across the country. 
creating an atmosphere of togetherness and accomplishment. It's an event that embodies the very essence of community, and that's something that we at the First National Bank really hold dear to our hearts. The unveiling and contract signing was held at the FNB head office in Accra. Chairman of the Dansuman Kifit Club had the stake on the deal. This morning event is significant in the history of Ghana sports. As we gather here to witness the contract sign off for the marathon, which is coming back to life after a seven year long break. This contract signifies our commitment to excellence, collaboration, and the shared passion for promoting a healthy and active lifestyle. The marathon will be beneficial to the country as it promotes socio-economic activities by boosting the sales of businesses, enhancing tourism, and uniting neighboring communities and the entire society. In this regard, we appeal to the government, corporate organizations, and individuals to support this prestigious event to enable to achieve the desired objectives and benefits. The multimedia group was also announced as the official media partner of the event. From the multimedia group side, we are also extremely thrilled to be part of this historic, historic event. The marathon is something we have watched grow from strength to strength over the past well, 30 something years and it's an absolute pleasure to put the might of the multimedia group in english and local language so what you can expect is on joy news on joy prime which we are using to push the marathon this year which is our generalist channel and also our mass media brands adum tv which goes nationwide um adum fm Hits FM, our entertainment and youth station as well. Then we have Love FM, which is for Kumasi and the middle belt of Ghana areas. And then you go to the western side, we have Inshira, which goes to that side as well. So six radio and TV channels will be pushing the Accra Marathon, plus, plus of course, all our digital energies. Remember, Joy Prime, which is taking this has footprints also is the channel apart from Joy News that has footprints in the rest of West Africa. So that's that's why we are using Joy Prime and not Joy News. And after more than half uh, a decade hiatus, the competition is coming back. Do join us at 2 p.m. as we bring you the signing ceremony of this partnership between the Accra Marathon and the First National Bank. We'll be bringing that to you at 2 p.m. This is our wrap-up sports here on Joy News today with me, Muftar Navila Abdullah. Still on midday, you are welcome to the showbiz segment. So yesterday came, um, did I say came from this door? Mr. Easy did something that has never been done on the African continent as a musician. So he had an album listening yesterday at the gallery, 1957 gallery at Kempinski. And now he inculcated fine art into his album listening. 16 track album uh, yet to be released, the evil, uh, the evil Genius. And 16 artworks to express exactly how he felt what he was writing the tracks and also the art fine art pieces also explains the songs well as at the event yesterday i was privileged to be there and this is a report i put together to transcend the ordinary popular ghanaian based nigerian artist mr easy has brought together artists from diverse corners of the world each weaving their interpretations into the very fabrics of his songs on his new album innovative synergy between music and visual art breathe new life into his new album earlier i just wanted to be able to do something different to make this album together and i feel sometimes when we make um, albums the music videos might not fully capture our expression and because this album is very personal to me i was looking for a way to more personally tell the story of the album and right now, everything I'm looking at doing is connecting African music, African culture, African art, African movies together. And so with this, I've been able to merge African art and African music. And this is, this is what inspires me right now. Art, music, movies, sports, you know, and it's what, it's, it's what I'm about now, it's what I invest in, is what I feel is my calling to 
to impact the, the creative community in Africa. Terminator hit singer King Promise joined the chorus of admiration for Mr. Easy. Classic, amazing, creative, artistic. You can see by what he's even doing right now. It's not even just music, but just art in general. It's a masterpiece, so shouts my boy Tosin, man. So you crazy guy, you know, he's always coming up with some crazy ideas and he never stops. I, I just feel like he's blessed differently, you know. Political luminary Gabi Ochiridakun was utterly captivated after listening to the tracks from the album. If you are creative, you have a responsibility to promote creativity in every facet. And for me, this is African creativity at its best. The full album is expected to be released in October. For Joy News, Jacqueline and Sumayavua. And it is going to be October 27th. That is the release date for the album. So please, make sure that October... But you can pre-order it on digital platforms anyways. Yeah, you saw Kim Promise there, right? So Kim Promise has been talking about his Terminator song, which is number one on the African continent. And he's saying that, actually, the choreography dance helped push the song to its height now. Not that the song wasn't good, the song was good, but the dance also did a lot of magic. There's a lot of work to be done. It's not done, nowhere near done. But um, yeah, bro, like whenever I make music or drop music, the plan is to top whatever I've done. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, my next song has to be bigger than the next one. The big one has to be bigger. Like I believe I'm yet to make my best music yet. Do you know what I mean? So. I'm just excited. I'm very thankful. Really and truly, you make the music and you love it, but the fans, the people, they make it what it becomes. You know, it's not up to me. It's the, the grace of God and the people. So I'm just thankful, man. Work is going to support your next song. Then Terminator is going to has given you or is giving you a challenge for the next track. It's never been like that with me. Never ever. Like from when I started. I only go to the studio to make music that I love. I'm not in, I'm not in no competition with anybody, but just myself and I. I try to give my best 100%. As long as I give that one, I leave the rest to God. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, did the, did the dance also do anything for the song? No, 10,000%. It has, like, even me, when I hear the song, I want to dance, eh? <laughs> so it's like, it goes hand in hand. But music and dance and art, intertwined you understand so when these forces come together it's powerful it's powerful so I respect all the dancers it was it was only right and perfect that we had uh, a dance for this because I don't really do dances for my songs but when I like there was something about the song I felt like it will go away one and you know look at what's happening do you know what I mean so yeah man blessings and that will be all for showbiz on the midday bulletin my name is Ibrahim Ben Bako Come you get more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. You enjoy the rest of our programs.